in our last lesson we learned about how there were many centers of weaving that came into being in several parts of the indian subcontinent in the late 18th century we mentioned how all these weaving centers were located along the coastal areas and this facilitated trade from these weaving centers to the european nations now we know that weavers are referred to those people who are associated with the task of weaving but linguistically all these regions have had various names associated with the weavers that is to say the weavers were called by different names in several parts of the indian subcontinent let us learn about those now in the northern and central parts the weavers were called julaha or momin and in bengal the weavers were called tanti in the southern part of the indian subcontinent we had the sail kaikollar or devang and these were the major weaving communities that gained popularity simply because of the cloths they produced now these weaving communities used to produce different kinds of textiles and they were also called by different names as you can see here but before proceeding with this lesson let me ask you a question quickly what was the weaving community in bengal region known as was it known as julaha tanti momin or devang well the correct answer is tanti the weavers of bengal were known as tanti now we will be wrong to assume that weaving is the only activity that is associated with the textile industry because several other activities together make up the textile industry different kinds of things need to be done in order to produce a piece of textile Firstly we begin this process with spinning what does spinning refer to in spinning traditionally the indian textile producers used to use instruments like the charkha and the takli now on the charkha the cotton or the fabric was spun and then it was rolled on this takli as you can see here and after this was rolled on the takli then came the activity of weaving after this fabric was rolled on the takli it was woven into clothes and this is how spinning and weaving together help in the production of textiles now traditionally speaking spinning was mostly done by women and the work of weaving was undertaken mostly by men now here you can see a tanti weaver as he had been painted by the flemish painter balthazar solvins here you can see how the tanti weavers are weaving a piece of textile and women used to do the traditional work of spinning the fabric now during this point of time different kinds of textiles were being produced in the indian subcontinent many had very bright and colorful hues printed on them and on the other hand many were also dyed in bright hues now to this end there were men called rangres and the rangres dyed the thread for colorful textiles as you can see here so these men called the rangres used to dye the thread in very bright colors and in this way they produced colorful textiles on the other hand there were the chip pickers now the chip pickers were specialized block printers here you can see how the chip pickers used to make very beautiful block prints on pieces of fabric so these were the ways in which textiles were produced in the indian subcontinent through the 17th 18th and even the 19th centuries a very important point that we need to keep in our minds in this regard is that the production of textiles requires different processes and various levels of work 
that is to say it is not just weaving that is required for the production of a piece of cloth different kinds of activities like spinning and then weaving and then dyeing printing are required to produce a beautiful piece of cloth and in this way we can understand that handloom weaving and the occupations associated with it provided livelihood for millions of indians because so many people depended on these kinds of activities to earn their bread and while indian textiles became prominent in several parts of the world and mostly in the european markets these people were able to earn their living by performing these activities in our last lesson we talked about how the growth of indian textiles happened at a particular point of time when the east india companies were promoting the sale of indian textiles in the european markets but subsequently over the years and due to the effects of the industrial revolution the demand for indian textiles slowly started falling and by the beginning of the 19th century english made cotton textile ousted indian goods from their traditional markets in africa america and europe now every region wants to promote its traditional goods its traditional markets and the same happened in england and several european nations as well all these european markets at this point of time were looking for the profit of their own textile industries which is why they were now trying to oust and completely throw away the indian textile producers from this scenario and the indian textile producers were also faced with a stiff competition firstly because it became difficult for them to compete with these european textile producers who had access to machines and so over the years by the beginning of the 19th century the indian cotton textile producers were severely affected in the international markets and along with this the worst came by the 1830s what happened then by the 1830s british cotton cloth flooded indian markets so at this point of time it were no longer the indian cotton textiles that were being sold in the indian markets instead it were the british cotton textiles or the british cotton cloths that flooded indian markets and you will be surprised to know that by the 1880s two thirds of all cotton cloths worn by the indians were actually produced in britain so the indigenous products were no longer in use and great demand in the indian markets as well so from this we can understand that this now dealt a severe blow to the indian cotton textile producers thousands of people who were associated with the production of the indian textiles were rendered unemployed just a while ago we learned how so many people depended on the cotton textile industry in the indian subcontinent in order to earn their breads because different kinds of activities are associated with the production of textiles and when the demand for indian textiles fell it was inevitable that all these millions of people who were associated with the indian textile industry were rendered unemployed they had no work because it were the british cotton textiles that flooded the indian markets and the british cotton textiles were also quite cheap at that point of time simply because those were produced in large bulks by the machines those were not manually produced as it was done by the indian indian cotton textile producers so this now dealt a severe blow to the cotton textile industry in the indian subcontinent now all these people who were associated with the cotton textile industry in the indian subcontinent were severely distressed they were struggling to earn a piece of bread which is why thousands of distressed weavers and spinners in india wrote petitions to the government to help them here we can see a petition that was written from 12000 weavers in the year 1824 it states that we must starve for food 
that is to say all these people were actually starving for food it became increasingly difficult for them to earn a living simply because the demand for indian textiles fell at this point of time now let us look at a sentence here owing to a misfortune the orangs have been abolished ever since because of which we and our families are distressed for want of the means of livelihood now orangs were the warehouses where different kinds of goods were produced and these orangs were abolished simply because these people were out of work they were misfortunate enough and they found it very difficult to earn their livelihood which is why they now started petitioning to the government for the sake of help and assistance but this is not to mean that indian handlooms completely faded out of existence because various kinds of indian textiles boasted of very rich and intricate patterns and designs which could not be produced by machines which machine can produce such intricate sarees and dupattas and churnis which were produced by the weavers by the spinners by hand which is why indian handlooms did not completely die and it was owing to the traditional woven patterns and for this reason sholapur in western india and madurai in south india now emerged as important new centers of weaving in the late 19th century so by the late 19th century we can understand that indian textiles were not that great in demand in the european or other international markets in fact indian cotton textiles were not in great demand in the subcontinent itself but it were the rich masses be that the indians or the europeans who wanted these traditional woven patterns and these traditional woven patterns could not be produced by machines which is why new weaving centers now came into being in sholapur which lies in the present day indian state of maharashtra and madura which lies in the present day indian state of tamil nadu we learned about how new weaving centers were coming into being in the indian subcontinent by the late 19th century now in this regard we also need to take into account the political scenario of the subcontinent around this point of time now this was a time when the indian national movement was at its peak the indian nationalists were trying their best to fight back british colonial rule from the subcontinent now during the indian national movement gandhi popularized the use of hand spun and hand woven cloth why was it so because this hand spun and hand woven cloth on the charkha was actually what the indian cotton textile producers produced that is to say gandhi popularized the use of native and indigenous goods so as to completely ban the use of british goods british cotton textiles in the indian subcontinent this was a time of surging nationalistic sentiments when the masses were actually wanting to use what was being produced in the country itself and so the charkha now came to represent india while talking about the process of spinning we talked about this instrument called charkha in which the threads are spun and now this charkha became the symbol of india itself it was the way in which india was producing its own native and indigenous textile and so charkha became the symbol of india and it was placed at the center of the tricolor flag of the indian national congress that was adopted in 1931 so here you can see the indian national congress's flag that was adopted in 1931 and here is the charkha well in the present flag of independent india we see the ashok chakra in the middle of the tricolor but at this point of time it was the charkha which was the symbol and the representation of india and it was used in the middle of the tricolor so in this way nationalistic sentiments were being filled in the minds of the people who were wanting to discard all foreign produced goods from the subcontinent but a question that arises in this regard is that 
what happened to the weavers and spinners who lost their livelihood just a while ago we talked about how these weavers and spinners were actually being starved to death simply because their textile industry was no longer functioning properly the goods they produced were not in great demand be that in the indian subcontinent or even in the european markets now what happened to these people these people were then compelled to work as agricultural laborers in the farms some even went in search of employment to the plantations in africa and south america so can you understand the plight of these weavers and spinners who have been producing textiles for many centuries and often hereditarily so these were communities of weavers and spinners and now they lost their livelihood and they were compelled to leave their own country and go to the far away lands in africa and south america to work at the plantations well many of these people also migrated to the cities in search of work and some found work in the newly established cotton mills well this is a matter of a new discussion that is to say at this point of time cotton mills were springing to being many new cotton mills were coming up where machines and proper technological equipments were being used for the production of cotton textiles and these cotton mills were set up with one intention that is to compete with the british produced cotton textiles and many traditional weavers and spinners found employment in these newly established cotton mills in the year 1854 bombay witnessed the establishment of the first cotton mill in india so just a while ago we mentioned this point that the cotton mills were coming into being at this point of time that is by the middle of the 19th century in order to produce more and more cotton textiles which were cheap in nature and which would be able to compete with the foreign produced or rather the british produced cotton textiles and to this end in 1854 bombay witnessed the establishment of the first cotton mill in the subcontinent by the year 1900 over 84 mills started operating in bombay but there is a very particular reason behind the growth of cotton mills in bombay Now Bombay is located in the western part of the Indian subcontinent and it is located close to those regions that have black soil and produce cotton which is why it was easy for these cotton mills to get access to the raw materials as in the raw cotton and it is for this reason itself that cotton mills were growing more and more in number in Bombay and these cotton mills also provided employment to many workers many people were employed here and they were working as weavers spinners dyers or in different capacities now slowly over the years cotton mills started coming up in several parts of the subcontinent in 1861 the first mill in amdabad was started and in the following year that is in 1862 a mill was established in kanpur now the growth of cotton mills led to a demand of labor we can understand that many kinds of works and activities are associated with the production of cloths which is why more and more people were required to work at these cotton mills now these cotton mills were useful in two regards firstly these cotton mills were able to produce huge bulks of cotton textiles at a much faster pace which is why it was easier for the indian textile industry to once again compete with the british cotton textile industry and at the same time it provided employment to those people who lost their works simply because the traditional ways of producing cotton textiles were no longer in use in the subcontinent following this that is by the end of the 19th century many cotton textiles were established in several parts of the indian subcontinent like in kanpur amdabad 
Bombay, Sholapur and Nagpur. So these places actually had easy access to the raw resources of cotton, which is why many cotton textiles sprang up in these places. Now we are not to assume that it was very easy for these cotton textile industries to establish themselves and gain prominence in the Indian subcontinent. This is because in the first few decades of their existence, the textile factory industry faced several problems. It was not very easy, it was not a very smooth road for the textile factory industry in the subcontinent to establish itself. One of the very important reasons behind this would be that it was difficult to compete with the cheap textiles that were imported from Britain at this point of time. So at this point of time, Britain was producing huge number of textiles and those were exported to the Indian subcontinent. And the markets in the subcontinent were filled with all these cheap textiles. In the first few years, it was not very easy for the Indian textile factory industry to produce goods at a cheap rate, which is why it became difficult for them to compete with these cheap products. And along with that, lack of protection from the Indian government was another major reason why the Indian textile factory industry faced a problem. Because in every country, the government usually imposes import duties on the imported goods. And why is this done? This is done to protect and promote the growth of native and infant industries. But at this point of time, India was not independent. India was under the control of the British crown and the British Indian government did not actually want to support the native Indian industries. Which is why import duties were not imposed on these goods which were imported from Britain. And for this, it became difficult for these infant industries to compete with the British textiles. So these were the problems that the Indian textile factory industry faced in its initial stage. The first major spurt in the development of these local textiles happened during the First World War. Now the First World War broke out in 1914. Now when the First World War broke out, Britain was no longer able to take care of these kinds of industries which had been set up in the country. Instead, it had to focus on fighting for its own territory, on fighting this war against the foreign powers. And as a result of this, imports from Britain declined. And since these imports declined, production in Indian factories increased. That is to say, it was the first world war which directly boosted the production of goods in the Indian textile factory industry. So in this way, the Indian textile mills were now gaining in their profit and prosperity. And this was a time when the national movement was also at its peak. So all these reasons together helped the growth of the Indian textile mills. In our last lesson, we talked about the challenges that were faced by the Indian textile industry following the onset of the rule of the East India Company in the Indian subcontinent as well as the growth of the British textile industries. In this lesson, we learnt about how these cotton mills came up in several parts of the Indian subcontinent to compete with the British textile industry. And over the years, imports from Britain declined because of the First World War. And the Indian national movement also promoted the growth and production of more and more indigenous products. And in this way, the cotton mills played a very crucial role in helping the growth of the textile industry in the subcontinent. In the beginning of this series of lessons, we talked about how after the textile industry, we will be focusing on the iron and steel industry. 
well it is the iron and steel industry and how it gained prominence in the indian subcontinent is what we will be discussing in our subsequent lesson don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon you can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the delta step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now